All right, um, good evening, and welcome to the great debate about the asteroid redirect mission, or as I've been calling it uh, online, <laughs> arm wrestling. I'm Jeff Faust, I'm senior staff writer at Space News, editor of the Space Review. I'm the moderator for the debate. Um, you've already gotten a great introduction from Dan about what the asteroid redirect mission is. Um, we're now going to have uh, a panel of experts debate on whether NASA should in fact continue to pursue the asteroid redirect mission. Um, we've got the ProCamp uh, represented um, on the far end there by Lou Friedman. He's the executive director emeritus of the Planetary Society. Uh, Tom Jones, former space shuttle astronaut, planetary scientist. Then we have the Khan uh, camp, represented by Art Harmon, uh, director of the Coalition to Save Man Spaceflight, and a former legislative director for Congressman Steve Stockman. And of course, Robert Zubrin of the Mars Society. Um, the way this is gonna be structured is that each side is gonna get 15 minutes. They can divide that up um, how they want among the two speakers. So we will do the con and then the pro side. So um, if, say, uh, Robert was to start and take 10 minutes, then we'd go over to the pro side, and then maybe Tom would take eight minutes, and then we'd go back to the con side. There'd be five minutes left for Art, and then seven minutes for Lou. So it depends on how each side wants to divide up that 15 minutes. Then there will be five minutes of rebuttals by each side. And then we're going to open it up to audience questions. Um, um, just as a, a note, um, thinking ahead as you're thinking of your questions, make sure your questions are short and to the point and actually in the form of a question. Uh, and then each side will get uh, one minute to respond to the question. You can direct your answer to either either the pro or con side, but the other side will also get a chance to respond as well. And so hopefully we can get through a, a number of questions. Um, before I get started, I just want to get sort of a feel, at least from the, the folks here in, in the audience, uh, show of hands. How many of you support the asteroid redirect mission? OK, I'll get a fair number. Uh, how many of you are opposed? All right, well, maybe slightly more than the opposed can. How many are undecided? Okay, we've, okay, fair number undecided, actually. All right, not nearly as polarized as the presidential election. Um, <laughs> that said, um, let's dive right into the debate. And so we're going to start off um, with the con side. And Art will lead. All right, take it away, Art. Well, I'm honored to join this distinguished panel. And thank you all for attending. I hope we'll have uh, some good fun and uh, learn something tonight. Uh, let me read you a headline from Popular Science. NASA's asteroid mission is dumb, says NASA Assessment Committee. That's not the onion. The Small Bodies Assessment Group, comprised of planetary scientists founded by NASA to study asteroids and related bodies, published their findings that the portion of the ARM concept that involves a robotic mission to capture and redirect an asteroid sample to cislunar space is not an effective way to advance the knowledge of asteroids or further planetary defense strategies. Additionally, the NASA's advisory council voted unanimously to recommend that NASA repurpose the asteroid mission to retrieve a sample from the Martian moon Phobos. This would accomplish all of the goals as described tonight, um, yet be more relevant to actually going to Mars. Advisory Council member and former Goddard uh, spaceflight director Thomas Young said, what we really should be saying is terminate ARM, take the 1.25 billion and apply it to technology to get people to Mars. That's a cold, hard facts of what we're saying. Buzz Aldrin said, bringing an asteroid back to Earth, that's, what's that got to do with space exploration? If we were moving outward from there and an asteroid is a good stopping point, then fine. But now it's turned into a whole planetary defense exercise at the cost of our outward exploration. Well, Buzz and the other experts have it right. If we had a greater budget, we could do interesting missions like the ARM in addition to preparation that's directly applicable to 
uh, going to Mars, humans to Mars. But given our budget constraints, we must not detour away from missions that really do directly apply to going to uh, Mars and the moon, such as the Mars flyby or a lunar research base that could uh, cover many uh, prerequisites. George Washington University Scott Pace told the National Research Council he was hard pressed to run into anybody who thinks that going to an asteroid is the right way to go to Mars. Pace believes the Obama administration decided not to do anything the prior administration was doing in space, and that's how the asteroid idea emerged, despite broad bipartisan and international support for returning to the moon. And just as an aside on that, uh, the, uh, the NASA administrator, Charles Bolden, stated, in, including at some meetings I was present, that we will never lead a mission to the moon in my lifetime in spite of our ISS partners begging us to do so. And so, you know, is some degree of attention to what our partners wish us uh, and are asking us to do would, would have been useful here. Congress is in high revolt as well. The current House Appropriations Bill would defund ARM. It states, neither a robotic nor a crewed mission to an asteroid appreciably contributes to the overarching mission to Mars. No funds are included in this bill for NASA to continue planning efforts to conduct either robotic or crewed missions to an asteroid. Instead, NASA is encouraged to develop plans to return to the moon to test capabilities that will be needed for Mars, including habitation modules, lunar prospecting, and landing and, and ascent vehicles. Nobody seems to love the asteroid mission. He, in this audience, there's more against than for. Um, and I think it's uh, very reasonable to pr uh, predict that ARM will not survive this administration. Kids are not donning helmets and playing asteroid miner yet. <laughs> uh, we've lost eight years, and given that China, that China and Russia have, uh, are starting to plan their lunar bases and, and Mars landings, you look at the, uh, some of the diagrams for uh, uh, China's Long March 9 rocket, and they list Mars transfer orbits in its specs, as well as uh, lunar. Uh, they know where they're going, and they're seeking to go there probably a lot more directly than with a uh, decade-plus-long detour from the, uh, the re real space exploration. Uh, and so thank you all very much. OK. All right. How much time did we use? Used uh, about five and a half minutes. OK. So nine and a half left. Come up here. Yep. Okay. Yes, I've got my slides here. Okay. There we go. Hi, everybody. Wake up. <laughs> you guys must have had a very good, fulfilling dinner because it's a very quiet room out there. Hope we have some uh, good discussion here. Thanks to, for Art for kicking it off. Uh, glad to be here. I'm Tom Jones. I'm going to talk about uh, the pro arm side of things. Um, 2012, is that when we first worked on this, Lou? Yeah, I think we should. So Keck Institute for Space Studies had a study uh, campaign out on the California coast, Southern California, and Lou and I were invited to be a member of a big group that was discussing this crazy idea of sending humans out to uh, uh, visit an asteroid, uh, a snared asteroid or a snared boulder, and it's been snowballing since then. So I was glad to see uh, Dan Masnek kick it off there this evening. He was there at that study as well. And, you know, the, the concept has matured and evolved, and it will continue to do so until we actually launch the thing. But let me give you my um, reasons why I'm in favor of this concept. And they're going to be very quick ones, uh, just five big reasons here. National leadership, getting a breakthrough in uh, lowering the cost of space exploration with space resources, bringing human sk skills to bear on exploring the solar system again, uh, advancing planetary defense, and then uh, getting some near-term progress in human exploration. We, Art just alluded to a lost eight years, I agree, and we needed to come to grips with that and get started again. 
So number one, I'm not going to read the whole laundry list. A lot of it touches on information that Dan gave you, but um, we need to establish and maintain our national leadership in the 2020s. Uh, without a mission uh, like ARM where astronauts get their hands dirty, we're going to be reduced to just repeating some Apollo-style mission profiles with this new SLS and Orion. In the meantime, the space station will be slowly dying and reaching the end of its life, and our friends, the Chinese, will be uh, launching their own uh, new space station, probably landing people on, on, on the moon by 2030. So you've got to have a competitive um, uh, play in this game of deep space exploration. So we want to get the astronauts' hands dirty within a decade uh, where we've lost all this ground in, in the current administration. We want to get U.S. astronauts ahead of any competitors out there, and I'm referring to the Chinese. If the Chinese land on the moon, it's not going to be a good argument to say, hey, we did that 60 years ago when you can't do anything of the kind today. You've got to have capabilities that exceed that. Um, we want to go beyond repeating Apollo and explore a second alien planetary surface and getting their hands on this ancient asteroid. Obviously, we're visiting with robots, but we want human exploration skills to touch the surface. And then, as uh, Dan mentioned, we have all the traits of this mission that feed forward towards Mars exploration, and I won't go into all of those in detail. Number two, um, very important from my point of view is to break through, uh, to create a breakthrough in use of space resources. And this starts that process uh, very vigorously with a view towards achieving a Mars mission with those space resources. So getting to a water-rich asteroid is the primary goal here. Uh, tapping it with human uh, exploration skills, but then bringing hundreds or tens of kilograms back to Earth so we can exploit it. And then invite international partners and commercial companies to go and exploit that same body that's now lingering in lunar orbit for exploitation. So that will lead to the advanced use of, uh, uh, advances in the use of water, regolith for propellant, radiation shielding, and uh, breaking the bonds of Earth for the first time. So we're going to sort of give a, a push to all the asteroid mining companies and give them something to exploit right away. Number three, we want to bring these human skills to bear on asteroid and uh, planetary exploration. Uh, we're talking about going back and looking at the very origins of the solar system. So we're going to look at this asteroid fragment, which has not survived a hurtling run through the atmosphere. It's not just a clump of dust that um, we're bringing back a few um, tens of grams. We're going to bring back hundreds of kilograms of this stuff uh, eventually with robots and that astronaut visit. And then we can imagine follow-on robots and astronaut visits to the same captured boulder to further test the processes for um, space resource exploitation and more scientific investigation. Um, it, ARM could just be the first of several crew visits starting in the mid-2020s. We wouldn't want to ignore this resource that's sitting out there. And finally, um, you know, we're going to get right to uh, the origin of the solar system with being able to put our hands on the macro structure of an asteroid, not just a tiny test tube full of um, sample return material, but uh, we'll be able to examine a big chunk of an asteroid up close uh, with developing capabilities as we get our initial reconnaissance complete. Number four, uh, planetary defense. Dan touched on that. All, all I will say is that we're eventually going to have to confront a rogue asteroid. And the more we know about the macro structure, the interior structure, the mechanical properties of an object up close and personal, the better we'll do when we finally have to confront a real asteroid threat. Um, and this will be a, a, a good way to kick off that characterization process. One asteroid isn't enough, but this is another one that we add to our zoo of experience around asteroids. And finally, um, number five, uh, we need some near-term progress in human exploration. Okay, this gives us a deep space presence near the time that the ISS is going to be decommissioned and at the same time that there are growing international capabilities. Uh, imagine choosing not to do ARM. Now you have a 2020s with a vacuum for U.S. space activity. Uh, we will still be in low Earth orbit. There will be a lot of tourist activity going on, but nothing in deep space except perhaps a few repeats of Apollo 8 on the Orion. And we want to avoid just looking like we're doing something that we did 50 years ago. The technology uh, applies to uh, other bodies like uh, near-Earth asteroids in their native orbits, uh, the Mars system, especially the Mars moons. And even uh, getting experience in lunar orbit is going to give us a jump start on habitats in lunar orbit. Um, we'll get some public support. Now, ART doesn't agree that we're going to have public support uh, supporting ARM, but look at what we had with just the first four or five hour Orion test flight. As soon as the details of what we're going to try with ARM or anything in deep space become known, uh, we're going to get lots of public interest and support. It's a near-term goal. The new president can support it without any, any new spikes to the budget. 
Uh, it won't break the budget. You won't have to double the NASA budget or even increase it by 25%. We can do ARM without um, uh, going in another 90 degree orthogonal direction to our space policy that we've just seen eight years ago. Um, alternatives, again, if we choose not to do ARM, you've got to look at the alternatives. We're going to look at an SLS and Orion without a really good mission, so the Congress or the President may cancel it. And then you've got no heavy lift capability except for, you know, one-third the scale of that with the, the commercial vehicle, vehicles are being discussed, uh, that are being discussed. And uh, if the ISS uh, goes away without us establishing ourselves in deep space or around the moon, then there is no U.S. NASA human spaceflight capability. All, I, all we'll have is commercial <coughs> tourism, while other countries are exploring the moon again. And finally, um, I think the ARM mission with its technology is very versatile. It opens up options toward lunar uh, near-Earth asteroids, stepping stones farther out, the Mars system of moons, and then Mars itself. And so we're making a choice. You know, if we're going uh, to redirect the asteroid redirect mission, you've got to come up with an alternative plan that can happen in the next 10 years. And I'm, I'm only hearing a little bit of a, a murmur from NASA about lunar habitats. And again, that's just make work for an astronaut in lunar orbit What's he going to do in a habitat out there besides testing the systems? Let's give them something meaty to do out there. Let's get their hands dirty. Thank you. Oh. And one shameless plug after the uh, debate, I'll be outside signing my new book, Ask the Astronaut. So meet me at the table outside after the debate. <laughs> that doesn't count in the eight minutes. That was a Thank you. Okay. So um, that was just, uh, just for anyone interested in timekeeping. Seven and a half minutes, so Hi. Lou, you'll have the other seven and a half minutes. Bob, you've got uh, remaining nine and a half minutes. So All right. Proceed. <laughs> I am against the uh, asteroid redirect mission because the fundamental thinking behind it is not spending money in order to accomplish something. It is doing something in order to spend money, okay, which is not productive. None of the rationalizations for the asteroid redirect mission make any sense. Now, first of all, when President Obama said, canceled the moon program, he said, we're going to go to an asteroid to get out of geocentric space and inter interplanetary space. The asteroid redirect mission sabotages that imperative by keeping our astronauts inside of geocentric space. Okay? It is a way to avoid the imperative that the president provided. Okay. Secondly, uh, uh, in terms of ISRU, I mean, okay, uh, they're going to move a 20-ton uh, asteroid. They're going to take, what, about six years from launch to get it to its position. Uh, okay. Now, in a retrograde lunar orbit, they're going to do this with a Delta Heavy 4 launch. A Delta Heavy 4 launch can launch 30 tons to low Earth orbit directly. So we are going to use a Delta Heavy launch to take six years to get 20 tons of raw material into lunar orbit when that same vehicle could launch 30 tons of refined hydrogen oxygen propellant in tanks ready to go into Earth orbit in an afternoon. And Earth orbit is a much more productive way to place to have propellant or any other thing that you might want to have, okay, because that's where you go to go on your way to Mars or to the moon or anywhere. In other words, if you were to refuel a spacecraft, you don't want to go to a retrograde lunar orbit on your way to Mars, you, but you are going to go to LEO on your way to Mars. Okay? The, uh, and then furthermore, I must say that of a 20-ton asteroid, perhaps 5% of it might be material you could turn into rocket propellant. So you're really getting one ton of useful material for your 30-ton to LEO launch. Okay? So this does not make any sense. Furthermore, you could get more, if you want asteroidal material, they just found a 30-ton meteor in Argentina, which the Delta IV Heavy could launch into Earth orbit, which <laughs> we could visit it there. And it would be just as useful a thing for astronauts to do. Okay, the, uh, which is to say, not useful at all, okay? The, um, okay, in terms of planetary defense, okay, this is not a practical method of planetary defense, okay? To, it, 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 all right, just to give you a sense, okay, you've got a 50 kilowatt electric propulsion system, all right? 
it would have to fire for 3,000 years to generate um, as much energy as a one megaton bomb. So if you had a serious Earth threat coming your way and you don't have 3,000 years to stop it, you're a lot better off launching a missile and hitting it on the side and blowing off material and giving the thing a nice proper shove. Okay? The, um, I did uh, a rough calculation of this thing. Um, I was getting, based on certain assumptions, which could be a little off, but about two-tenths of a millimeter per second delta V that you're going to be able to impart to this uh, uh, thing. Um, now, if you want to, uh, if you've got a year in advance of impact, and you generate two-tenths of a meter a second delta V, you can adjust the, the position of, of where it will intersect the Earth by one Earth radius. That's a thousand times more, okay, than, 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 than this. That is, if you had a year you would, to, before the impact, you would have to do a thousand times the adjustment to this. So, in short, the, this gravity tractor is not a practical way of diverting asteroids that are any kind of real threat within any kind of realistic time frame. This, this is not planetary protection. Okay, this is, it's, it's an intellectual curiosity. The, um, uh, okay, in terms of, 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 of planetary science, we could learn much more about asteroids by sending out small probes and gathering the one kilogram or 10 kilogram samples from lots of planetary bodies or even from lots of places on this body, okay? And, you know, uh, I, I have to say, you could also, in other words, you're just doing this to give asteroid astronauts something to do, okay? You're taking possibly the most skilled personnel that there are in existence, and you're trying to think of something to waste their time doing, instead of actually deploying them for what they're worth. And what they're worth is for exploring other planets, not for gathering samples of rocks from a rock that has been brought back halfway by a robotic spacecraft, which could have brought it back all the way. Um, the, 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 so, you know, a, a two, they're to explore planets. Now, what could you do in 10 years? Well, we certainly could land on the moon in 10 years. We did it in eight years the last time, okay, starting from nothing. Um, and what else could we do? Uh, frankly, I think we could do uh, humans landing on Mars in 10 years, be, if we were serious, because, frankly, Relative to today's technology, the technical challenges of sending humans to Mars are much less than sending men to the moon was in 1961, and we were there eight years later. And for us to say that, oh, no, no, that is decades out, and we can't do that, it's basically saying we can't do that. We are no longer the people that we used to be, and that is something that we cannot afford. And certainly anyone, I mean, we're going to have 10 presentations here on Saturday from 10 different design teams, which will show how we can do a two-person Mars flyby mission by the year 2024, um, which would be a lot more interesting than uh, visiting a two-meter diameter rock. Um, it would, for instance, put to rest all these uh, concerns or alleged concerns about radiation and, and so forth, and you know would show that it can be done and, and, and demystify interplanetary flight. What Obama wanted us to do was demystify interplanetary flight by going to something in heliocentric space instead of avoiding doing so. So we should do it. Now, but above all, and, and then also the solar electric propulsion. Yes, you can dream up Mars mission scenarios that use solar electric propulsion. You could dream up Mars mission scenarios that use hydrophones. I mean, air, anything. Um, but there is no particular advantage to using electric propulsion for Mars missions. Okay, electric propulsion will not enable um, uh, quick trips to Mars. That is a falsehood that has been perpetrated by, uh, well, 
Franklin Chang Diaz and others because the, the, the weight of the power system is such that it would actually take much longer to get to Mars with electric propulsion than it does with chemical propulsion. Uh, you can use electric propulsion to about cut the mass, the launch mass of a cargo delivery to Mars um, of a given size. But first of all, that is not a mission critical technology and you could accomplish the same goal by cutting the cost of space launch in half. Okay? And with much less mission complexity and much broader applicability. Um, so what you have here is somebody saying we want to do this mission in order to um, have something for electric propulsion to do because we have written into the Mars mission plan that it will use electric propulsion um, even though someone sitting down and really designing a Mars mission would not necessarily, and I would argue would not, if they were arguing how to design the most efficient and effective Mars mission, would not use electric propulsion. Okay, because all the added complexity of reusable interplanetary electric spacecraft that have to be refitted and refueled in space and so forth to come back and pick out cargoes and this and that and the other thing in order to accomplish a reduction in launch mass, um, or in other words, launch cost, could be accomplished much more effectively and much more simply by efforts to advance launch technology. Okay. Um, you know, so the, uh, for instance, reusing the first stage of a launch vehicle might cut launch costs in half. And certain people are working on that. Anyway, looks like I'm out of time. time. To conclude, I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lou, you've got seven and a half minutes. So we'll get to counterpoints uh, later in the discussion. I want to start out by saying uh, I'm a Mars guy. I've been in, Mar in Mars exploration ever since my days at JPL and all my days at the Planetary Society. And I am focused, and I will yield to no one in this audience, including Dr. Zubrin, on the question of my desire to have humans go to Mars as quickly as possible. So I am coming at my support for the asteroid redirect mission as finally getting us to do something, getting us beyond the stage of going beyond the moon and taking those steps out into interplanetary space. I wish we could do some of the things that other people here would like to do. I wish we could send astronauts and jump to Mars. I wish we could send astronauts and jump into interplanetary space. That was the original idea, but we can't do it. We don't have the systems to do it, and if we wait around for the systems to do it, It'll be decades before we start to get that along. We could stop what we're doing now and start all over again, but it won't get us there anywhere any faster. I look at the asteroid redirect mission as somewhat like I looked at the Gemini program during Apollo. I wasn't particularly interested in Earth orbit rendezvous and docking spacecraft. I was interested in going to the moon. And everybody on Earth knew what the Gemini program was about. It was not about Earth orbit, it was about the moon. But it didn't go to the moon, it was a step toward the moon. Another example I'll use is, I, I regard our distance to Mars like a distance across an Im impossible stream to get across. There's no bridge to get across it. I don't have any machines that will jump over this stream. Uh, I, the nearest bridge is hundreds of miles away or years in the future in another direction. So I'm taking the stepping stone approach. I'm bringing the stepping stone down from the bank, putting it into the stream, taking the first step, and starting to make my way across so that I can build up the capability to get to the other side and build up the infrastructure for future exploration. That's what the asteroid redirect mission is. It is a, uh, a quicker way for us to advance our human flight capability and our systems for getting into the solar system. There is no quicker way, not within today's budgets. We all can, have, can point to student projects and, and our architectures about doing Mars faster, but those aren't the ones that are, are being implemented. What are being implemented are the systems that we now have. And I was disturbed at this conference to see uh, people recommending that the way we get to Mars is cancel the only three existing programs we have right now in NASA that are working on the journey to Mars, the SLS, the Orion, and the ARM mission. That's how they would go to Mars faster. Well, I can assure you that by uh, stopping and, and trying to come up with another architecture, we won't get there faster. 
But there is another point, and, and Tom alluded to it. It is that you, the human space program needs a win. Many people think NASA stopped exploring because humans aren't out there doing new ventures. Well, so we are doing something that no other country could do, that no other agency could do. We're going to move a part of the solar system to make it accessible to humans and conduct human operations there. That's an exciting venture. It not only shows our leadership, it shows our capability and builds up the, the, uh, the whole capabilities for moving out into the solar system. It will restore ex exciting vitality to the program just the way great risky adventures have always done so. I have, I, I have no doubt about that. There has never, I've been in this business a long time. There's not a single space mission that I didn't think was better when I was conceiving it or I was working with others who were conceiving it. I can go back to Voyager and Galileo and Mars rovers and the Venus orbiting missions and say, oh, when I was working on it, we had a better plan. Well, yeah, but when the reality came for all those missions and all the compromises that had to be made to make them happen, those missions turned out to be great and they did advance exploration. I am confident that when we get up to that asteroid and the reality of humans working beyond the moon in the next decade, not in some future time, that we'll be taking the steps and, and implementing uh, not the longer life uh, crew habitation systems, the uh, increased astronaut operations, and the capability for going deeper into space, that we'll finally be making progress and making those humans go to Mars. So that's my conclusion. All right. OK. So, so let's go on to the rebuttal, five minutes each side. Do you want to say anything? Um, I'll get, uh, just briefly. Um, if you take a look at this mission, and, and something that you had alluded to is, you know, if we're not doing this, we may be doing nothing. The Mars flyby is something that we could do in 21 or 24. That would grab the attention with of... Humans? The, with humans, yes. Yeah. What are they going to we, it's our rebuttal. You can go. <laughs> just a question. Okay. I just wanted to... Um, <coughs> you know, we... This is a one SLS uh, mission where uh, Congress, thankfully, has is, uh, is, uh, directed uh, building a habitat and, and uh, they, they would uh, support it and so forth. And, and uh, so that's one thing. Um, our ISS partners, what they really, really want is what uh, 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 Administrator Bolden said, they want to go to the moon. They want us to lead a mission. And, uh, and build a, uh, a lunar research base where we can learn how to live on another world and then with lessons learned in a safer way, go on uh, to Mars. But China is going and the thing that scares me is that if we're to believe that China won't try to claim the moon as theirs in our absence, they're setting a very poor example in the South China Sea. China is not a friendly, uh, uh, you know, chess partner or something. They are, uh, you know, what we see in the South China Sea is, um, you know, very territorial um, uh, aggressiveness. I don't want to, if, if we abandon the moon to them, they will, uh, that, that they will happily take it. Okay. Also, I mean, look, I mean, it said, if we don't do this, we're not doing anything. Well, no, if we don't do this, we can do something else. Okay? We could, I mean, really, if you have an SLS and an Orion uh, and a uh, Earth escape stage, hydrogen oxygen stage, and a LEM, you can do the moon. And does anyone say we can't do that in 10 years? We got the SLS and Orion both in an advanced state of development right now. So the idea of, if we don't do this, we're not doing anything, it's the other way around. It's because we're doing this, we're not doing anything. That's the problem here. And yes, with this, the SLS, an Earth escape stage, an Orion, and an in-space HAB module, we could do manned missions to near-Earth asteroids in heliocentric space, or a two-person man-Mars flyby mission. 
both also easily within 10 years of now. So it's not if we don't do, do this, we're not doing anything. It's because we're doing this that we're not doing anything. We could easily be on the moon in 10 years. Alternatively, we could easily be exploring near-Earth asteroids in heliocentric space within 10 years, if that's what we decided to do, instead of this rather bizarre exercise, which is a way of avoiding leading Earth-centered space. We should be spending that billion dollars, in my view, on developing an in-space habitat so that we can send astronauts to explore actual asteroids, not to recover fragments of a boulder which itself has already been recovered by a robotic spacecraft. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Bob, and, and thanks, Art, for your um, points of view. I, in, in the larger part, I agree with the whole um, idea of going back to the moon. I wish that we were going back to the moon right now. We were going to do that about eight or nine years ago, uh, but the current administration decided not to go back in the lunar direction. So the political and the budget reality right now supports only uh, missions that don't include the moon. Um, that could change with the election. We'll see. I don't think there's a real a great idea about what to do next in space from uh, either of the political parties that are um, uh, looking towards November. But I will say that you know we've had eight years to get the president and his administration warmed up to going back to the moon, and it hasn't worked. Uh, his, his directive to go to a, an asteroid in the mid-2020s, uh, announced in 2010, was what NASA was working to, but the budget to do that was not delivered by the administration. So NASA, I think, in good faith, has worked towards finding a compromise mission in ARM that achieves some asteroid activity, uh, but does not obviously complete the, the directive that the president laid out. But if the president really wanted to do that, he would have allotted the budget to carry out that. It's not a technically daunting task, it just requires the budget. So the reason we're not doing it is because the current administration just does not want to go to an asteroid in deep space. And so this is a, a saving face measure uh, for an administration that doesn't want to fund what it announced it wanted to do. And I don't think there's any great prospect that they're going to change their minds in the next iteration of this administration to do a, an aggressive lunar return. So that's uh, number one. Um, we can use the existing budget regime to accomplish the ARM mission. I think everybody agrees with uh, the technology matching the budget for the next 10 years or so. I hope, it, I hope it's augmented and we can do lunar habitat operations and we can get back to a lunar return. But if that doesn't materialize, we should not be throwing out ARM as a starting initiative. We should be keeping that alive as our gambit for exploring another kind of planetary surface, get astronauts involved in deep exploration once again. Um, you know, I think um, ARM is a great way to kick off lunar operations, first in orbit, then we can go down to the surface if we get the good luck to have a support of Congress and administration. And I think the international partners would come along with the asteroid redirect mission and the ability to sample uh, extraterrestrial material. They'd jump on board that bandwagon if we had that resource circling the moon in about 10 years. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get a change in conditions that will allow us to be much more aggressive in space, but I think we ought to take the opportunity that's, that's been given us to do something new and keep US leadership in the 2020s in both technology and human capability and exploration. I'll just add the, uh, of course, the international partners would like to uh, us to go to the moon and, and bring them along. They haven't been there. We have. Uh, and so the idea that uh, they want us to uh, uh, do it for them or, or to help them get there is, shouldn't be driving our space program. Furthermore, how much money are they putting into it? Almost nothing at, at any level. And so uh, this idea of invoking that the international partners are, are, are a reason that we should do it is, is not. Uh, if, we bring, if we continue to assert our leadership in space, we will bring the international partners along. I'm confident that we know how to do it. We've done it very well on the space station. Uh, what people forget is that Constellation, which was supported by the president and had a NASA administrator deeply supportive of it, redirected programs to make it happen as fast as he possibly could, had already slipped the landing date out to 2028 by the time it was being canceled. 2028, the asteroid redirect mission is going to get and uh, astronauts doing things in space years before that, even with the eight-year delay. If we, this idea that we could throw a lem up now and, and get there quickly, 
That's ridiculous. Even with the full budget support of the previous administration, it was slipping at two years per year, and uh, we've done that experiment, and, and we certainly shouldn't go down that trap again. That is the detour to Mars. If you want a detour to Mars, try to build a landing system for the moon. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I definitely think if you're, the view is, and in fact it was Mike Griffin who once had this view, the idea is build your transportation system up, move us out into the interplanetary space, make the accomplishments along the way, and let the landing system be the last step you do. And that will happen in the, as NASA has outlined and has been outlined here in the 2030s when we have done the orbiter mission and then start to move to the surface of Mars. All right. <clears throat> well, now you've had the points and the counterpoints, and it's time now to take your questions from the audience. If you got a question, raise your hand. We've got a microphone runner. Let's take the gentleman in the gray shirt right there. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, and thank you. Um, I've got a fast question for the gentleman on the left, and it's very simple. How the heck do I sell this to fourth graders as an educator? Is it your left or our left? Your, my left, sorry. <laughs> okay, so that would be me? Yeah. Okay, and, and the question was how do we? Sell, sell arm to fourth, fourth graders. graders. Sell it to fourth graders. I think this mission is, is made for fourth graders in a, in a way of excitement and adventure. The idea of moving the solar, I have no trouble with kids in explaining it. The idea that we move the solar system and have our astronauts operating on a, P, on a, P, on a celestial body 10 years before it would otherwise be possible is not just uh, uh, a fairy tale, but something that we can really do. That's the way to sell it to fourth graders. Now, if you're talking about trying to compete with other people's paper schemes about uh, uh, ways we wish we could do missions, well, that's science fiction, and maybe that is a better cell, but it isn't a better space program. Uh, when you uh, return the samples from the asteroid boulder, you give uh, a piece of that asteroid to every elementary school in America. That's how much sample's coming back. So we own 20 tons of asteroid stuff that we can distribute to classrooms. That's a good way, too. Right. Well, just on to return to this point, I mean, if the that might work with some fourth graders, but those that are persistent in asking questions uh, might, in fact, uh, ask some pretty good ones. Uh, the, uh, that would undermine that. But just to return to this other point, this idea that this is the only thing we can do. If NASA put up to say, we want an in-space HAB module, we're willing to give $1 billion fixed price contract for someone to develop it, they would get bids, okay? And that would complete the hardware set so that we could go actually visit asteroids. This idea, I mean, that we are so senile that we simply can't do anything and therefore we have to think, you know, it's, it, I mean, think how absurd it would have been if in the 1960s they said, well, we're going to develop the Apollo Command Module and we're going to develop the Saturn V, but we're not going to build the limb. Okay, so we'll be able to go to lunar orbit. That's what we'll do. If you want to do something real in space, you have to develop the whole hardware set. And, you know, uh, you know with Constellation, they were laboring under the fact that most of the manned spaceflight budget was going to shuttle and station. It was not going to Constellation. Okay. And so there was a misallocation of resources if you actually wanted to accomplish a moon program. Okay. The, uh, you know, you got $6 billion a year going to other things. Um, what is amazing is now that the $4 billion a year shuttle program is no more, somehow we still don't have money, um, which means that there are institutional problems to be corrected. Uh, but it, it, it's not an objective problem. I'd add that... Um, Actually, we're, we've already gone over the one minute, so we'll, right. we want to get some more questions sure. here. Oh, okay. Uh, as I understand it, there's some trade space between the cost, incremental cost of doing the Mars flyby compared to the existing cost of steep keeping this asteroid, ast asteroid redirect mission. I haven't really heard any comparison between the incremental cost of making the choice to the flyby compared to the, the, 
the cost of the asteroid redirect mission. It would be kind of interesting to hear if, if there is some perception of what those numbers are. Does it cost tremendously more to go ahead and do the, uh, the Mars flyby? Because I think that has a lot more value, you know, dollar for dollar and minute for minute than the, than the asteroid uh, exercise. And if we stay with the asteroid exercise, what is, what is the real point of electric propulsion here? Because it, doesn't ha it, it has such a low thrust power compared to electric prime power. It's not going to buy you anything. If you're going to do anything like that, bring on nuclear thermal propulsion and let it be a workhorse for something where you can actually do something with it. Because at least nuclear thermal has a, has a role to take you to Mars. Uh, electric propulsion does not have a role to take you to Mars in any serious way. If you want, if you want, you know, so that's my question. Where are, where are, the, where are the numerical trade space, uh, where does it go when you ask how much more money does it do, require to do the, uh, the, the Mars flyby? I think that's a really salient point we'd like to understand from any and all of you. Thank you. Well, where, uh, uh, let me just deal with the SCP question, because um, I've actually spent a lot of my career at, uh, early being against solar electric propulsion, but I've become convinced it is enabling for more humans to Mars because of its tremendous cargo capability and the, and the importance of building up that cargo capability to support humans, not just going to Mars as a one-off stunt, but going to Mars continuously. So uh, SEP, not for the human mission, but SEP for delivering the cargo and the infrastructure. Just like if I was moving across the country, uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily drive across the country, but I would send all of my goods in a truck across the country, and then I would take the fast trip in the airplane. That's the way humans to Mars uh, will go. The cargo capability will move slowly so that it can get the great mass there. As far as the Mars flyby alternative, of course, we don't have a cost on it because nobody's working on it. It's not even in the systems that are being proposed to be built. The idea of humans taking a, a three-year round-trip interplanetary voyage and being supported in a crew system that has closed-loop ecological life support for all that, of course it's more expensive. We haven't even started to design it yet. That's a long way off. It is, and, and we can wish that we had the systems to do it. We can wish the country would again spend uh, five or ten, uh, eight percent of its budget on the space program, but that isn't happening. We're not going to spend Apollo type money to accomplish this goal in eight years. We're going to spend uh, this, this generation's kind of money to accomplish the goal incrementally, sustainably, and keep moving forward. Okay, let just comment there. Um, the NASA budget is like 18 billion a year, um, which means that if you delay humans to Mars by 10 years, say, you are adding 180 billion dollars to uh, the cost uh, before we get there. It, it costs most not to do anything. What NASA has done, they're developing a launch vehicle without anything meaningful for it to launch. So they're, going, they're proposing to launch it once every four years or something. Um, and you have perhaps a, a human infrastructure supporting that launch vehicle program that's costing you several billion a year. So therefore, every launch you do to ha simply maintain the SLS for four years at three billion years, $12 billion dollars a launch, which is absurd. Instead of launching it once every four years, you should be launching it four times in one year. Um, and that means you actually, if, if you want to actually get anything for your space dollar, you have to have a real exploration program going, not just a, a nominal program to pretend that that you're doing something when you're not. The, the, the cab meter is running whether it's moving or not. This is a program which doesn't actually go anywhere. It doesn't actually do anything. It is it's just something to say, we had, look, there's astronauts, they're going to space, they're getting some rocks. You know, the, 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 they could bring the rocks with them and then bring them back um, and, and do EVAs and all that. We, we should be having our, our program mission driven, not have our missions constituency driven. 
okay, driven by the need to fund certain constituencies in electric propulsion or elsewhere or to make astronauts appear useful when they are not useful, in, 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 instead we should put them to use so that they are useful. All right, another question. On the, uh, j just real briefly, on the uh, um, flyby versus uh, asteroid, uh, <clears throat> I've seen Dennis Tito's numbers and I don't know them off the top of my head, but the uh, numbers he had put together for uh, the habitat, the life support, and the other critical things, um, not counting the, uh, the, the launch that we'd be doing anyway for the asteroid uh, mission, uh, I would say it's roughly comparable to the, uh, uh, to the robotic craft that's going to go out and back to, uh, to bring back the asteroid. Disagree. Right. Yeah. Next question. Just, uh, some next question. Uh, back there. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I could care less about cost. Um, and frankly, I could care less which country does it. Uh, what concerns me is the Yucatan Peninsula, um, the evidence that we have come across here on Earth about asteroids hitting Earth. But it doesn't scare me that we're bringing an asteroid closer to Earth. What, what I'm wondering is, can we manage all of these things together and crash the asteroid into Mars? Do the mining on Mars as part of a dust bowl type experiment. Um, can we land something closer and then use the next 50 years to actually move it from Mars back to Earth? Because frankly, I'm kind of afraid of us messing up and having it crash into Arizona. Thank you. So I'm an asteroid scientist. What was the question? Can we crash, can we crash the asteroid into Mars and then mine it from Mars? So with the SEP, you can redirect asteroids in a number of directions. There's been proposals uh, to, you know, take a naturally orbiting asteroid and use it to ride, uh, ride along with on the way to Mars. You choose one that's almost on a Mars transfer trajectory and then adjust its orbit. So SEP would be a, an enabler for that kind of asteroid cycler. So yeah, if you want to slam something into Mars, yes, but to what point? I don't understand the point. Uh, Mars has all the native resources that you would need to do anything on the surface for colonization. So you don't. Well, from in my view, the propellant that you need, the shielding you need, is 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 needed in cislunar space to build up an expedition to go to Mars. So yeah, that's where you need the material. And then you use Mars propellant, Mars generated propellant, to come back. Let's have all another right. question. All right. Gentleman here. Yes, um, um, I, I had uh, basically two questions. To the pro arm side, I wonder, would it not really be better just to go out, get the rock, and bring it back to Earth, you know, autonomously? And to the anti arm side, what is the real benefit of, of aside from psychological, of the um, Mars flyby? Because I'm not seeing it. I, if I understood your question to the pro-arm side, it says, wouldn't it be better to bring the asteroid back to Earth autonomously? That is what we're doing. We're building, we're bringing that asteroid back. Or did you mean to land it on Earth? Yes. Well, that would uh, destroy it. That, uh, yeah, there would be no point to that. You'd burn it up in the atmosphere if you burned, uh, brought back uh, that size of a boulder, and you certainly don't want to bring back a bigger one and, and hit the Earth. So. Uh, so the whole intent is to bring the asteroid back with the comparatively very low cost robotic mission so that the astronauts can conduct the operations on it that gets the human space program uh, accomplishing uh, things in, in, in near Earth space or in cislunar space or beyond the moon uh, on an earlier time scale. Well, 100, 100 kilograms is all you would need to bring back for study, for exploitation purposes on the ground. That's what you need on the ground to design those processes. In. But when you want to conduct those operations where all those asteroids are, they're in, they're in, in solar orbit. So let's, let's do the work out there. Let's develop the processes. Let's develop the astronaut handling techniques, the robotic handling techniques to do that work where we need to actually mine the asteroids. Yeah, but to answer your question, they absolutely could do that. You could bring, say, a dragon with you out to the asteroid. You could pack it with a ton of diverse rocks 
and bring that thing back and have it enter at Earth and then be studied by scientists in the lab, and you would not need to do the whole SLS launch and the astronauts and all of that. Um, and, and you could probably bring back more who, samples that who way. Who would do the packing? But, but the, the, if, if that's what you wanted to do, if this was important to have those asteroid samples. Now, as far as the Mars flyby is concerned, um, it's to do a Lindbergh. Okay? In other words, what did Lindbergh accomplish? He didn't transport any cargo. He didn't transport any passengers. What he did was prove that transatlantic flight was possible. Okay? Now, okay, if I was the manager of a human Mars program uh, and I was adequately funded, I might not do the two-person Mars flyby mission. Although I should add that the uh, Von Braun team when they uh, designed their manned Mars mission in 1969 to be done by 1981, it did have a Mars flyby mission as a preliminary mission. Um, but they did not have moving an asteroid into lunar orbit as part of their mission architecture. And I would submit to you that no one who was designed, who was put in charge of a humans to Mars program and said, here's your budget, get the job done, would say, well, I'm going to take part of my budget and put an asteroid into lunar orbit. Or not really an asteroid, but a 20-ton chunk of an asteroid. This is just totally tangential to the, uh, to the mission. This is make work. Okay, so developing an, a deep space habitat that could be used on a Mars flyby mission, which, by the way, is a two-year mission, not three. Every opportunity, there is a two-year mission that flies by Mars and comes back to Earth. It is because it comes back to Earth exactly two years after the Earth was there, and so the Earth is there again. And the, um, okay, and it doesn't need a closed ecological life support. It can use a physical, chemical life support uh, system. Um, the, the, but that same habitat is part of the um, hardware set that is needed for an actual humans to Mars mission. You would actually be proving it on a mission that is more difficult than a human Mars mission, because it's two years instead of six months each way. But the um, uh, but it could do it, and it would also enable actual human missions to near-Earth asteroids, real ones, which would be of some interest to actually go and explore these kilometer-sized objects and see uh, their structure and their strength and, 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 you know, because if you did have to plant an explosive in such a thing in order to knock it off course from hitting Earth, you'd really want to know something about the, the structure of these bodies, not just about the geology of a small sample removed from them. We're about out of uh, time, could, so I want to take one more respond. question here and use that as sort of a, and give the opportunity for each side to do a wrap up as well. So, gentlemen up here in the front has been very patient. I heard from, from the speaker. I heard from the speaker before this panel, and I think also from you, that the uh, part of the benefit is that it helps enable a humans to the surface of Mars mission. And I've been struggling to find what technological risk of a humans to the surface of Mars mission the arm would actually retire. So my question is, is it just a matter of planetary defense and and allowing us to do things until we get the political support to do more important things, or what specific technological risk? are we retiring that would help us get humans to Mars faster or safer in the future? Well, the two, the two big ones are the SEP, which has been mentioned to, to, uh, to have the capability to move the system, move big cargo to Mars, and the other one is astronaut operations uh, and, and advancing that, whether it's retiring the risk of them working on the surface. But I, I want to return to this because I actually agree with, with Bob in the sense that but his premise was, if I was the head of the Mars program, or if anybody was the head of the Mars program, they wouldn't design it with an asteroid in it. Well, of course not. We wouldn't. If I was the head of the Mars program and given the money and the thing and told, go to Mars, that would there'd be lots of ways of doing it. But nobody's doing that. No government has ever said, in fact, they've ruled out the idea of establishing a Mars program. They will only let us go in the incremental steps. Elon Musk, for all of his entrepreneurship, he hasn't been given a mandate to go to Mars or even issued one. He built a Falcon 1, he built a Falcon 9, he's building a Falcon Heavy, and he's talking about building a Mars transport system. There's steps that you have to do along the way. Nobody get out of the idea that I can do it better if, I, if they would only give me the money to go to Mars. We're not going to be given that money to go to Mars. You're going to have to go in incremental steps, building up the capability each step at a time. That's what we've learned. 
I, I know some people who were involved in the asteroid, uh, some of the asteroid mining uh, ventures you may have heard about, and they've been saying that ARM would intrude into what those industries are already planning, that their investors would just sit back and not do anything now because they would want to wait until 2027, 2028, whenever the, uh, the asteroid uh, mission is concluded and uh, taking validation from that. So what this could do is it could actually delay the, uh, the birth of an asteroid uh, mining uh, industry by a decade or longer. We really should let commercial space do asteroid retrieval and mining and let NASA concentrate on the giant leaps of pioneering permanent human presences on the moon and Mars. Tom, do you have a final statement? Well, my response is that, you know, putting a 20-ton mass in lunar orbit is a lot more accessible to those private mining companies, planetary resources, deep space industries, than having them to, to hitch a ride on somebody else's rocket, uh, fly a multi-year mission to get there uh, with a very small spacecraft. This way, they could piggyback on something and get out to lunar orbit and then harvest or exploit you know, tens of kilograms. They could shove it into a hopper. If it gets broken, the next astronaut team that visits can kick it and start the machine up again. You know, that kind of um, practical experience would be very valuable. And so I don't agree that it would delay uh, or, uh, uh, or flood the market in some way. Okay. And another counterpoint is that the asteroid community has actually turned around completely on this. The SBAG statement that Art read uh, is several years old, and our most recent one was very supportive of the asteroid redirect mission. And just this last week, uh, a number of companies are now making proposals, including the commercial mining companies uh, or asteroid uh, companies who believe that their asteroid mining is in their future. They're making proposals to be part of the ARM mission. They are responding to the call for partnerships uh, and, and being part of that mission. This is the only way they're going to get there in the near future. OK. Right. Well, yeah, the final thing. OK. Lou admitted that if he was the manager of a Humans to Mars program, he would not include an asteroid retrieval mission in it. Okay. If I was and given no, the no, money, no, 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 excuse me. Okay, now the, okay, now if I was the manager of a Humans to Mars program and I had adequate money to do the mission as I wanted to, well, then I would do it as I wanted to. If I had inadequate money to do the mission as I wanted to, I would take such money as I had and spend it on things that are help get me to the mission. So, for example, one of the hardware elements that you need to do a round-trip Mars mission is a Mars Transit Habitat spacecraft. You must have that. That is part of it. Also, incidentally, that would be part of an asteroid exploration program. Okay, so if I got a million dollars, a billion dollars, excuse me, of spare change here, okay, and I think this thing's gonna cost a lot more than $1.2 billion, but if it's $1.2 billion or $3 billion or whatever it actually turns out to be, that money would, if, if your goal is humans to Mars, and NASA claims that its goal is human to Mars, they got their big you know, chart with all the different things, it says journey to Mars, okay? If you're saying, we are developing a plan to get to Mars, then you use the money you have to actually develop things that you need, as opposed to what they are doing now, which is they're doing a random set of activities that are not connected to Mars, and then they're trying to somehow justify them by saying this is somehow associated with Mars. In other words, if you were, there's two ways to build a house. You can think of the kind of house you want to build, design the house, buy those parts, and build the house. Or you can go randomly cruising garage sales on weekends buying house parts that appeal to you and pile up the parts in your backyard. And then when your relatives come and say, why do you have all this junk in your backyard? You can hire an architect to design a house that includes all of these parts. Okay. Uh, now, now, now that house will never get built because it's an impossible house. You have to include aluminum siding, Doric columns, a spiral staircase, a fountain with a statue of Napoleon in the center. Okay, you, you, you need all these things um, because you have them. Okay, so that's the difference in the logic here, and that's the fundamental problem with this mission. 
Okay, yes, NASA does not have unlimited resources, so we might not get to Mars as fast as I would like. But if we have some resources and they should be spent, there should be a plan and the resources should be spent to fulfill ob objectives and create technologies that are part of that plan. If it has to go slower, it goes slower. But right now, we've got the money to develop this in-space transit habitat that is not orthogonal at all to the path of humans to Mars. It's part of it. It would also enable near-Earth asteroid missions. It would take this incomplete hardware set, an incoherent hardware set, a heavy lift booster with nothing for it to launch but a capsule which could be launched by a much lighter booster, and <clears throat> but together, with just those two things, it can't do any deep space missions. If you added a LEM to it, it could do lunar missions. If you add a TRANSHAB to it, it can do Mars and asteroid missions. Take your pick. But in order to make this hardware set coherent, <clears throat> you have to add one or the other, and you shouldn't be wasting resources on a make-work mission. All right. With that, we've already we've gone our, our full hour and actually a little bit more. Uh, it's clear that uh, there's a lot of passions that are raised about the asteroid redirect mission. Um, we could probably spend all night talking about it, but there's another panel coming up. Before we go, I want to do one final quick round of uh, audience participation like we did at the beginning. How many of you at the beginning of the hour who said you were undecided or opposed to ARM are now in favor of it? Raise your hands. Nobody. How many of you who were undecided or in favor of ARM are now opposed? Raise your hand. Well, we got a few. <laughs> All right, so it looks like the uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like art and mob. And thing. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you to, to, thank you guys. to the panelists right. for an engaging discussion. Thank you very much.